What's going on, everybody? The time has finally arrived. The very first edition of the Sooners Illustrated podcast, the official Oklahoma Sooners podcast on the 24-7 Sports Network. It's been an arduous journey to this moment, but we are here and we are so thrilled to be with you, your voice of Oklahoma Sooners sports on the 24-7 Sports Network. Josh Calloway with you, James Jackson alongside me. We're going to have more guys coming along later in the show and, of course, later this week as well. But first off, James, we're here, man. The podcast has launched. We've been wanting to do this. The board has been asking us. They've been kind of chomping at the bit really ever since the site launched back in early May. But we are here, my man. It, it is go time. Yeah, this is the exciting stuff right here. This is where <laughs> you and I get to really, really show our, our spark and what we can do for the site. So this is great. Finally getting on here and having a podcast that'll that'll go and pretty be pretty good for everybody out there. So I can't wait. Yeah. It's going to be a, a great time here, especially with OU and and all the excitement that they have for their season and what they're going to do. This is this is awesome. Finally here, man. Seriously, it's uh you know we like I said, people on the boards are our great VIP subscribers have asked us a few times. You know, uh, podcasts that come, we've always kind of just kind of had to be like, it's coming, it's in the works. We yeah. promise, and now we're here. So the way this is going to work, these shows we're planning on about a couple episodes a week in the season. We might add a third one in the mix, it's like a little post game type of show. They're going to be digestible, 30, 35 minutes or so a piece. Sometimes maybe a little shorter, sometimes maybe a little longer. And the way this is going to work, you can expect to see myself and James on the show pretty much every time. Of course, our great lead recruiting analyst, Colin Kennedy, will be along very uh, often as well. He's going to be on this show, uh, this very first episode, a little bit later on. And the great Tom Green will also be featured heavily on the show as well. He won't be on this episode, but we're going to catch up with him later in the week as he's on assignment right now in Nashville for SEC Media Day. So we're definitely going to want to get his insight on uh, all the latest there uh, in the show later this week. But we're thrilled. We're pumped to, to get to be here and get to uh, dive into the latest, uh, obviously, with the current team, recruiting. Uh, this, we're going to talk a little basketball when that time comes as well. A lot a lot to be excited about here. So we're, we're pumped to uh, get to bring this show to you. And uh, hopefully everybody tunes in regularly and enjoys it and gets a little extra insight from what uh, the VIP subscribers already get, of course, uh, on Sooners Illustrated, Oklahoma.247sports. Com. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and dive in. Last week was Big 12 Media Days. All four of us were in Arlington, Texas at AT&T Stadium. The very final Big 12 Media Days for us next year will be at SEC Media Days, which was just reported actually will be in Dallas next year. Much easier for us than, than Nashville <laughs> like it is this year for, uh, for old Tom. Looking forward to that. But one final time with Big 12 Media Days. It was a weird vibe. Um, last time for OU in Texas in the conference, Brett Yormark. This was his second Big 12 Media Days because last year was like he had just he was just about to start the job. So he was there. He spoke, but it wasn't like really his baby yet. This was the first Big 12 Media Days that was really in his vision. And it was very different, weird layout, things like that. But overall, an interesting uh, vibe about it, James, before we get into Oklahoma specifically, just kind of that. Interesting dynamic. It's it's kind of awkward, in, in for lack of a better word, uh, with OU and Texas still kind of hanging around uh, for another year. Seems like a lot of the Big 12 teams are kind of ready to get to that next era, but for a year still, OU and Texas are, are still here, still hanging around. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, I mean, he, he kind of wanted to, Yomar wanted to uh, really show that OU and Texas were, they, they appreciate what they've done for the conference. Right. But also mentioned that, the the conferences, you know, the two schools aren't bigger than, than the conference, so it, you kind of got to read between the lines there and, and see what he means. And you know, a lot of a lot of things that he brought up uh, in that one, which is like uh, what OU has done and wanting to keep mm -hmm. all of the championship uh, venues, the championship venues for the Big Twelve as they move forward without OU in Texas, which you know, softball obviously is going to stay at the Hall of Fame Stadium for uh, right. fans that you know, softball that want to go back out there and watch that and. You see, football wise, obviously want to stay in Jerry World as AT and T Stadium, I should call it, but Jerry World as as most people know it as. Yeah, and I mean, there's just so much that he, you know, he kind of wanted to keep the same, but also enhanced it a little bit. And uh, it's not a lot of news that a lot of OU fans and Texas fans can take, you know, as they leave the conference. But it'll be interesting this season to see how that plays out and uh, what will happen with Brett Youngmark on there another year of him leading the way. Yeah, it's gonna be. It is going to be a weird last year, and it's always been kind of weird, and it was funny. I, I, I failed to remember. I believe it was the legendary Kirk Bulls who asked Brett Yormark 
which you kind of prefer if, if OU or Texas didn't win the Big 12 in this last year. And he he very pro move sidestepped that question. But it is kind of a Big 12 trying to find their identity outside of these two teams. These are the two biggest brands by far in the mm-hmm. conference, and they're leaving. So it's going to be an interesting dynamic. Didn't help their cause in the little promo video that Brett Yormark played twice for us that they touted seven Heisman winners. Four of those are by OU, one of those by Texas, and one of the other ones was by Nebraska. So that was kind of a, a weird move, uh, I think, for your promo video. But it's, it's a new era for the Big 12, and it is like this weird little middle zone where it's this new era, but OU and Texas are still kind of hanging around. So uh, I think all eyes are on 2024. But for Oklahoma, first up, is bouncing back from last year, obviously – not covering any new ground in the slightest. Year one of Brent Venables, not what they had hoped for. Six and seven. We're still entered the year, considered one of the top favorites in the Big 12. We're still looked at as a you know top 10 or 15 at the lowest team in the country. Still thought they might be on the fringe of the playoff conversation. Didn't go that way at all. Six and seven, 0 oh and five in one score games in Brent Venables' first year. But James, year two, Brent Venables sat up there on the podium and He's gotten a lot better in, in from in, – I know that you're kind of new to covering the team, but for somebody who's been around last year for everything for Brent Venable so far, it's clear that he's gotten more comfortable at the mic and things like that. He's much more kind of – he's not as long-winded. He kind of gets to his points a little bit quicker than he, than he did. He's still long-winded, but not as much so as before. And he sat up there and said, look, last year was well below our standard, nowhere even close to what we had hoped for. But we've learned lessons. We're going to be better this year because of last year. We've learned and grown from it. That's the kind of vibe you got that just the confidence, not even from Venables, but all four of the players that we got as well. The confidence is there that we know what went wrong and it, it's getting corrected going into this uh, 2023 season. Yeah, definitely. And and also to point back to what you said about the Heisman winners, uh, you mentioned four from OU, one from from Nebraska one from Texas. Baylor had one as well to round yeah. up at seven with Robert Griffin the third. And then, I mean, you talk about the two, these two teams, OU and Texas, leaving this conference. They have been the head of this conference for as long as they can be. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Oklahoma's won 14 of the last 27, <laughs> you know, Big 12 championships. I mean, yeah. so like that's a stat that just can't be overlooked. And so when you have that and what Oklahoma has accomplished in this conference, it explains why there was so much, you know, disappointment in Brentville's first year. And, and as you said, he he comes on and he, he doesn't have the year that he wants to. But now I think he's seeing a lot of those, you know, five losses, those five close losses at the end of the year. Yeah. It's like, man, I think the guys are, are starting to get what I'm putting forward, what the kind of defense I want to run, how the offense is set up. I think a lot of guys are experiencing uh, what I want them to experience. And you know Venables has that, has it in him, you know, playing, uh, being as a defensive coordinator for Clemson, leading them to two national championships. He knows what he's talking about. It's not a guy that hasn't done it before. He just has to do it as a head coach now. And so I think that's, as you pointed out, that's that's what it comes down to and what uh, what he's wanting the guys to see. And I think the players are seeing it as well. Efficiency was uh, set a lot at, at the Big 12 media days and uh, game-specific points of the, you know, yeah. points of the game was, was, was specified a lot. Of Just a couple more plays could have gone their way and they would have, had a very, a very different season. And I think everybody had to learn from that, the players, the coaches, and Venables himself. And I think that's why there's so much optimism for this year because they can they can learn from what they just did. Yeah, you know, something that works in, in Venables and this, this, this team and this program's favor right now is that they still have fan support, which, mm-hmm. you know, I think a lot of these diehard blue blood programs especially, which that's a select few group, but a lot of these programs, especially in the SEC where Oklahoma's headed, it, it, one bad year, and it's like, okay, can the coach start <laughs> over? OU fans are not like that with Brent mm-hmm. Venables. It, there is a still a strong belief internally um, in Norman, in Oklahoma, for OU fans that this is going to work. They're going to get this where it needs to go. Nationally, the approval rating and the belief in Venables is pretty low. But mm-hmm. within Oklahoma, within OU fans, there's still a lot of hope there. And a big reason for that is – Simply put, this roster is in a much better place than it was a year ago. They have upgraded the depth tremendously. I was a little caught off guard to hear Brent Venables be as blunt as he was talking about last year's depth. Said it was you know non-existent, zero, none. Those are the words he used about the depth on last year's team. And then he said this year the competitive depth, just worlds different. He said it back in the spring. He expects the defense to be on another planet. That was the quote that he used. And Brent Venables doesn't really just say stuff to say it. 
he's putting these things out there because he believes it. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to argue with them. They've made lots of great transfer additions. They, had a, they signed a top five signing class, not too shabby. And then you throw in the fact that some of these guys who were true freshmen last year who didn't see the field are going into their second year and are going to be much further along. James, it feels like depth-wise, Oklahoma is in a way better spot than they were last year. And that can only help because, again, going back to the previous point, all those close losses, a big part of that is just guys being tired at the end of the game. That won't be as much of a problem this time. That's that's what a lot of players said at the Big 12 Media Days. I mean, it comes down to that fourth quarter at the very end and just – just being tired. And even Brent Venable said he kind of regretted not playing those younger guys more, you know, in that situation right. as, as if he didn't trust them enough or, or, you know, he wants to get more reps. I mean, that's the biggest difference in all of this, the situational football and having the guys to be there. And you've seen that the OU coaching staff has brought in some more guys, especially on the linebacker side that should make an immediate impact this season. So and I think that was their main focus. And, they, and they've done that when you have your quarterback coming back and, uh, some of your receivers coming back, you kind of focus on that defense, which is, you know, his bread and butter, what he really mm. knows how to win games with his defense. So and I think that's that's what came down to as well. 100 percent, 100 percent. So I think overall, the the overarching theme vibe, whatever you want to call it for Oklahoma, is a kind of a confidence and an understanding of what went wrong last year, both from the coaching perspective and fixing the roster and Brad Reynolds being a first year head coach, but also from the player's perspective, you know, especially like Stutzman and Gabriel, there was a lot more of kind of a, we know, we know what last year was Mm -hmm. and we're ready to to fix it basically Mm -hmm. uh, this time around. Of course, we're all as a society addicted to talking about Bedlam and the end of the Bedlam (laughs) rivalry. Mike Gundy, of course, Oklahoma state head coach popped off a little bit on the first day completely and he's done it before it's not really anything new but he completely threw it all on the shoulders of Oklahoma saying hey look Bedlam's over because Oklahoma's leaving conferences that's true on a surface level but also if both schools would play ball a little bit you could probably continue it as a non-conference game obviously Florida and Florida State do it Clemson and South Carolina do it Georgia and Georgia Tech do it that's just within the SEC so it's not it's feasible you could absolutely do it Brent Venables then kind of flipped it around, took a much more kind of cordial approach to it, but did have to throw in the little needle that, hey, we're not ducking Bedlam. OU wins Bedlam the, uh, the the majority of the time. I think he said they were pretty dang good in mm-hmm. those games historically. What's your thoughts, James, on the whole Bedlam thing? You know, you're an Oklahoma kid. I'm an Oklahoma kid. It's a shame to see it go. Um, but, I mean, we'll see it again at some point, but I think it, it, it'll be a while. It is a shame. And, you know, as growing up, you know, your, your grandmothers and your grandfather, uh, well, for me, uh, both went to Oklahoma State. And then, you know, my parents went to o- OU. So you kind of have that. You kind of watch the games together, that Bellum series, uh, them going against each other. And you have bragging rights throughout the year, you know, just between your parents and your family. And, you know, that's mm-hmm. that's kind of how it is for a lot of people in Oklahoma. It's, you know, you have family go this way and family go this and the other way. And you kind of can have that. That, that talking point throughout the year of how your teams did. And if you beat, beat each other, I mean, it's just icing on the cake. You know, it's just one of those great things. So the fact that Bedlam will be ending and doesn't seem to be coming back in any time soon, is, it is a disappointment. And I think that's the way a lot of fans uh, feel it as well. Uh, obviously, Mike Gundy has his own opinion on how, how everything goes. And yes, it's, it's, it's kind of OU's fault for leaving, yes. But mm-hmm. like you said, you can make it, you can make it work. Um, but my goodness, said he's not going to change the way that he does things or Oklahoma State does things to just have the game happen for, you know, for OU fans or for whoever wants to see the game. Yeah. Uh, I think there's still just a little animosity towards it and how, how OU left and how and Texas are leaving. Um, so I think that's the biggest reason uh, right now for that. Yeah, it's the Oklahoma Super Bowl. I mean, it's the biggest game in Oklahoma every year. Yeah. And uh, whenever we get there in early November – for the final time in Stillwater, we're all, you know, we'll, we'll be there at T Boone Pickens Stadium. Uh, it'll be a scene because it'll be the last time going in there for who knows how long uh, for Oklahoma. But, you know, we, we've seen this play out before. Texas and Texas AM did this pretty much this exact thing mm-hmm. and they didn't ever play. They didn't rekindle it. Now they're forced to because they're going to be <laughs> in the SEC together. But in the decade or so since AM left the Big 12, they never played again, and uh, I hope that's not the case with Bethlehem. It's a lot of fun, even though OU does dominate it um, historically. You know, obviously, since the beginning of the game, 
it's still on that day when the ball kicks, it feels like you're getting ready to watch something crazy happen because there's been lots of crazy bedlam games. Now, in the end, OU usually has more points on the scoreboard than Oklahoma State does, but mm-hmm. it doesn't change the fact that the game is great. And, you know, uh, television networks love it. I mean, last year's bedlam game, OU was 5-5. Five and five, OSU was like 6-4. and four. I can't remember their record. It was ABC primetime because it's better. <laughs> it, it, it's a huge national draw. So mm-hmm. we'll see. Now, OU's got the SEC slate and the Texas game and things like that. Oklahoma State doesn't have anything close to that uh, moving forward. So I think the impetus will be there to get the game back at some point, but it, it might be a little while. All right. Kind of makes you, makes you wonder what the rivalry games are going to be now in the Big 12. Like, what, what are the biggest any. rivalry games? Yeah, there aren't any. Uh, Kansas State and Kansas, I guess. Yeah, if That's Kansas can one. yeah, Kansas can repeat what they <laughs> did last Baylor's year. Baylor has become a, a, a decent one. But yeah, it's uh the marquee games that yeah, Brett Yormark can take to television, you know, uh partners or whatever and, and sell like, oh, you get this game. They don't have anything right now with the current current group, but it's not gonna change. I mean, you can go add your Boise States or your San Diego States or whatever they can try to add. It's not gonna really change it. Uh the Big Twelve's best hope is just that, you know. A few teams are are perennially ranked in the top fifteen with an expanded mm-hmm. playoff, and you know that that's where you kind of go from there. But you no, know, great point. There's not any big rivalry yeah. games. In I was the thinking maybe really. maybe Baylor and Oklahoma State could become one, just the way that their game in the yeah. Big Twelve Texas Tech and Baylor yeah. is a little bit of one. Texas Tech is kind of that sleeping giant, I think, in the new Big Twelve. Okay, got great facilities, diehard fan base, renovations coming. Joey McGuire is like all Texas Tech. Like it feels like he's going to be there for 30 years. Um, <laughs> they kind of have – they have some – there's there's some room there for Texas Tech to be, I think, one of the perennially top teams in the new Big 12. They have a lot mm-hmm. of upward, upward movement there. Um, anything else uh, from Big 12 media days that, that stuck out to you from a certain player? It could not, not even necessarily Oklahoma um, from the, any of the other 13 teams. Anything else you wanted to, to bring up or touch on here on this uh, first episode? I think there was one thing that when Venables came on on the presser and, and spoke, I didn't realize this, is that you know, OU led the Big 12 in tackles for loss and interceptions last year. Like yeah. you, you hear a lot of the, the defensive struggles, and you just talk about that a lot, and you kind of forget the good things that they accomplished last year. Mm-hmm. And obviously that, that wouldn't have happened, you know, those two stats in the last five or six years that, you know, OU's been at the top of not just the league but the nation. You know, it's like, Hmm, that's a that's a very good improvement. That's something that you really could build on, and that's what Venable said. It's a it's a building block yeah. uh, for this defense, and you know it goes to show another aspect of them wanting to of knowing that they can improve in year two under Venables. Yeah, hundred percent is a building block, and that that's something that Clemson was so good at under Brent mm-hmm. Venables. They led the country in tackles for loss and sacks and those kind of big negative plays all the time, um, mm-hmm. and so. Him bringing that over, even though it was overall a disappointing year, is really encouraging. Also, Ethan Downs, a big part of that. He was the only guy on the All-Big 12 team uh, for Oklahoma. They have just one guy last year was their punter, Michael Turk. They have one guy this year. It's a defensive end, Ethan Downs. But, you know, look, I've said this before on some other outlets, entities. Oklahoma didn't have a single defensive player drafted last year. That hadn't happened in a long time, but it was twofold. Mm-hmm. Reason A, one, whatever, was the defense was bad. But reason two, all the best defensive players from last year's team are back. Danny Stutzman, Ethan Downs, Billy Bowman, Woody Washington, they're all back. And they added all these new guys that are exciting. And so there, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic that uh, defensively it's going to be a lot better uh, for Oklahoma in 2023. I also got to say what was like the funniest thing of the week for me. I absolutely loved. I asked Jonah Laulu about the new guys they brought in in the summer, Dejon Terry and Philip Pea. And he, he told a story about all the defensive linemen going to see the new insidious movie. And he said, <laughs> Dejon Terry refused to go because he said, that stuff's real. I'm not trying to bring that home with me. That was hilarious. <laughs> Cracked up. Uh, Jonah Laulu. He was great, by the way. Uh, he was great because there was a whenever the list came out for the players, I think we all, everybody was kind of like Dylan Gabriel, obviously, Danny Sussman, obviously, Drake Soups, that makes sense. Jonah Laulu, um, <laughs> you know, defensive end from Hawaii that played one year. Now he's moving inside, but he was awesome. I totally see why OU picked him to do that now in hindsight because he was just a pleasure uh, to talk to. He was, he was great. So, uh, good stuff, Big 12 Media. It's final time uh, for us. Next year, we'll be going to SEC Media Days, which will be in Dallas. 
pretty exciting. Uh, yeah, the trip, uh, the trip will be great. Short, it's actually a shorter trip, I believe, now that we're heading that way. So that, that'll be uh, pretty good. Yeah, I look forward to that. Next year's – it's going to be insane because next year – Big Soul Media Days are still in Arlington. They're not moving. SEC Media Days are in Dallas. They're at the Omni Hotel in, like, downtown Dallas. Mm-hmm. Also going on is MLB All-Star is in – Arlington next week at that same time, the all-star game and the home run derby and all that. So it's going to be just, Oh yeah. We're catching one. We're catching. Oh, one. we're there. We're, <laughs> we're there. It's going to be insane. Uh, we got a whole, we got a long way to go before then, but I can look forward to it. We can, we can look ahead to it. All right. Well, there you have it, James. Appreciate you, sir. Stick with us. We're not going anywhere. We're going to, James is going to tag out. Colin's going to tap in all the latest on the recruiting side. Oh, you picked up a commit while we were at big 12 media days. And they have a couple more big fish sitting out there committing this week. We'll get the latest intel from Colin right here coming up right now on the Sooners Illustrated podcast. All right, now bringing in lead recruiting analyst for Sooners Illustrated, Mr. Colin Kennedy, CK. Welcome to the program, my guy. First podcast. This is a big this is a big moment. This is our first podcast together since we were in as roommates. So big moment for the two of us. But then yes. I also was cracking up, you know, our first podcast as a site, and it's the most Colin Kennedy thing ever for me to drop all this money on a brand new home office backdrop. And our first podcast is in a hotel in front of the coffee bar. So I'm sorry, folks at home. This is all you're getting. Whatever whatever this is supposed to be. I guess this is the side of the building. But yeah, I mean, I'm excited to be here. I'm out on the road getting more coverage for Sooners Illustrated, but excited to talk some ball here on this beautiful day. Absolutely. Like I said at the beginning of the show, um, you can expect James not to be on pretty much every time, but Colin and Tom Green, of course, who's not going to be on this episode, but he'll be on later in the week to talk about his time at SEC Media Days, will both be featured uh, heavily and regularly. And Colin, obviously, our lead recruiting analyst, few few people uh, have their finger on the pulse of OU recruiting as well as Colin, so going to lean on him heavy, especially in the recruiting talk. Um, Before we get into it, you touched on it a little bit. You're on assignment right now. We weren't sure if we we're going to have you on for this episode, but you made some time for us. Let the good yeah. people know uh, where you are, what you're doing. Yeah, this is one of the best stretches of the year, and it's something that I always look forward to, and I really miss when living out in Nashville, Tennessee. Texas High School Coaching Association puts on an annual event called Coaching School. Usually it's out in San Antonio, but I'm actually out here in Houston at the event with 24-7 Sports National Recruiting Analyst Mike Roach. He's always gracious enough to take me down, and we spend a few days yeah. getting to know all these high school coaches, but then college coaches from all over the country come. It's an incredible opportunity to network. Shane Beamer was here. Jay Valai was here from Oklahoma. You had Mac Brown coming in from North Carolina. Matt Rule is in town from Nebraska. So Texas high school coaches from all over the state naturally in town. We're getting to know all of them and just – talking some ball, but also getting to know more about a lot of these college staffs. And I think the biggest thing for me, too, is like you mentioned it, how does this apply to maybe the content or the podcast? Well, I'm out here and these are also opportunities to talk some ball. And I've sat in on lectures from Jay Valai to like a Rhett Lashley, who Oklahoma will face early on in the season. And Rhett Lashley, I got to watch him go through some offensive stuff. And obviously I can't share all of that, but it's going to give us a really cool content concept going into game weeks like that or any of the other colleges on the schedule who are represented out here at coaching school this week. So it's been a blast. I, I really did miss it last year and it is delivered this year yet again. And we're still in the thick of it, man. Two more days. So excited to break it up with a little football talk here on the show. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good stuff there. And, uh, you know, Colin is uh, out on the road driving all over the country, but especially the state of Texas often. So uh, this will not be the first time I think that you, uh, you hop in from us from a undisclosed location. Of course, it's disclosed here, I guess. But yeah. yeah. Um, all right, let's hit some recruiting stuff. Oklahoma's getting hot. Things have been uh, after that dry spell where they went however long it was, a few several weeks without any commits. Fans got a little antsy. It's been kind of a regular flow of the last month or so here. The latest happened while uh, Big 12 Media was just kind of wrapping up. Is big Jaden Jackson from Bradenton, Florida. He's an IMG Academy kid, 2024. Defensive lineman, we have him as the number 41 defensive lineman in the class, number 57 player in Florida. Colin, break it down a little bit. Uh, what kind of a player is Mr. Jackson? He seems to be one of these guys who can kind of 
outplay necessarily his ranking type of a thing. What uh, what yeah. do you about about Jaden Jackson? Well, look, man. Anytime our director of scouting, Andrew Ivans, likes a player, I like a player. You know what I mean? That guy sees a lot of football, especially at IMG. You know that territory more, and I know that he personally is someone that admires Jaden Jackson's game. He's talked about it on the recruiting podcast, Force of 24-7, on shows. Jaden Jackson was one that I think a lot of our members of the national team were very high on going into this decision. And I personally believe he could be someone that rises up in the rankings depending on what his fall looks like. I mean, he's heavy-handed, sturdy built, what, 6'2", 300-something pounds. He's he's yeah. well-structured as well, not a lot of bad weight on him, which is another important piece. And I think he's someone who plays the interior tech at a high level. And, yes, he's a three-star, and some fans at home may say, oh, no, what is it, the three-star <laughs> you phrase yeah, flying around? Right everywhere? Like, yeah. But at the end, of the end of the day, I think there's two big things that stand out to me about Jaden Jackson. Number one, He's the type of defensive lineman, in my opinion, within Brent Venable's system that you need in the SEC. And what do I mean by that? Like I mentioned, he's sturdy, heavy-handed, physical, yeah. aggressive. He has taken over games at Interior Techs, and that's hard to do, especially at the high school level where things are so perimeter-based now. And on top of that, off the field, Jane Jackson is an incredibly high-character individual. You saw it when he committed with us live at 24-7 Sports, just an outstanding human being, was raised well by his mother, and I think he's someone who's highly motivated. And when he comes into a program and a defensive line room that's led by a human being and coach, a talent developer as well, like Todd Bates, it's a match made in heaven. And so yeah. I think this, this was a bigger win than people might be making it out to be. And I think Oklahoma understands that on a number of different levels, and we'll get into that. But as far as just Jaden Jackson, this is a heck of a football player and a heck of a person, and that's the type of individual Brent Venables wants to see walking through those doors. Yeah, I'm not going to pretend to you know watch every kid's live commitment across the country, but I can't say I've ever seen one that let his his mother announce it for him. That was uh, mm -hmm. a little different. Uh, kind of goes to show you, I think, a little bit like you're kind of saying the character thing and uh, things like that. Good, good family, good upbringing, things like that. So. A lot to be excited about. I'm sure something that a lot of Oklahoma fans are probably curious about. What impact, if any, does this have on David Stone? Uh, David Stone, obviously, top five defensive lineman, number three, number two. Uh, we have number three, composite number two, top ten player in the class. Almost any OU fan knows all about David Stone at this point, I think. Um, those two guys are very close. Uh, they've been tweeting back and forth, sharing a lot of public love on, on Twitter and things like that. Do you foresee this having any impact on Lanny Davis Stone for Oklahoma at all, even a little? Tons. I, let's flip it. I think this has a lot to do with Oklahoma's pursuit of David Stone. And, and let's take it from a different angle here, Josh. Yeah. So you mentioned it. They're close. They've tweeted about playing together, this, that, and the other, right? It, that's probably the natural inclination that things will take whenever we'll talk about Jaden Jackson and David Stone. But what I kind of got the sense of and working closely with, with someone who has been incredible to work with and Gabby Arudia at Inside the U, we have been dialing back and forth with Oklahoma and Miami-based Intel. And I think one of our primary takeaways in this was that Miami and Oklahoma ended up battling towards the end there because I think they both knew that if getting Jaden Jackson was a thing, getting David Stone became a whole lot more realistic. Yeah. And so why is that maybe a little bit different than the whole friendship narrative? Well, in Oklahoma's case, they were always kind of maybe number two, number three. I never personally had him as number one until literally the very end. Texas was a major player. He had visited Ohio State. Miami's just down the road. Like there were so many other contenders who had mm -hmm. prime standing throughout essentially – this entire recruitment. Well, Oklahoma continues to pursue. And then eventually when Miami really starts to kind of hit the gas in the back end, I think Oklahoma said, all right, enough of being number two, number three. Like we have to be number one because, and this is the key phrase here, if Jaden Jackson ends up at Miami, that's probably the biggest threat of a program to land David Stone more than anybody else. And so, yeah. yes, they're friends, this, that, and the other, but 
The Canes specifically have told Steve Welt, Fong, a number of other members of the 24-7 Sports Network and sort of feelers, like, this class was essentially coming in with the goal of building a historic defensive line class to go off of the offensive line group that they put together the previous cycle. Well, David Stone has always been a target for Miami. And so because of that, I think the Canes knew they could potentially change the momentum in that race by trying to get someone like Jaden Jackson. Mm -hmm. And Oklahoma said, we can't let this take place. Just can't happen. Like the moment Jaden Jackson, if he had committed to Miami, I think we're sitting on this podcast and having a really intriguing conversation about David Stone. And so that's why I think in the end, that challenger in Miami – changed a lot for OU, and it's why, in my opinion, the Sooners really made a push there to try and get Jaden Jackson in the class. Do you kind of buy into this, like, kind of little bit of, of a budding Oklahoma-Miami kind of rivalry type thing that's kind of been kind of been simmering a little bit? If they've been both been on a few guys, why Gilmore, one of them, uh, a couple others as well, um, that they've kind yeah. of gone back and forth. Obviously, everybody saw Brent Venable's little – Halfway comment at Victor Media. I think it was on a radio interview where he kind of referenced Miami without saying Miami, talking about, you know, kind of blown out by Middle Tennessee, clearly referring to Miami. It's kind of just been an interesting little thing. Is that all just social media, do you think? Or is there a little bit of like a Oklahoma staff and Miami staff are kind of almost mono we mono right now? They're, they seem to be chasing a lot of the same guys. I mean, I think it's a little bit silly, but I also <laughs> think it's to July. Be yeah, like it's July, it's talking season. But I yeah. also think if you really wanted to try and put two to it together, Oklahoma's moving to the SEC, and so a prioritization of the state of Florida is mm-hmm. now more imperative than ever. And so I, if you really tried to make something of it, which I wouldn't, but this would be the counter argument to sort of play devil's advocate. Sure, Oklahoma's probably going into the SEC knowing that Miami's really the only competition – maybe outside like Florida State and a couple other schools, Clemson, for example, that could challenge them and all of those other SEC programs for that talent out there on the the Southeast Coast. And so I think Oklahoma's trying to, and again, I don't really buy into this, but like maybe Venables is trying to hype up the fact that Oklahoma is a prime destination for South Florida kids. And it's no secret. I mean, you mentioned it. They've been in a lot of battles recently between the two. You've got – Devon Mitchell, James Nesta, Wyatt Gilmore, if you want to call that a recruiting battle, and then obviously the Jaden Jackson saga wraps up. And so in this very short amount of time, these two have been (laughs) back and forth. I've had a lot of phone calls go out to poor Gabby, man. But, yeah, I I think it's a little bit ridiculous. But, again, if you want to try and and say there's layers to everything, then maybe that would be the layer I would take to try and explain it all. Sure. It's fun. It's, it's July in college football. I'm, I'm not complaining. I mean, at this point, let's get a non-con game together, even though those, those things are scheduled out to, like, freaking 2030. So, do I don't know. Let's make it happen anyway. Let's do it. I was at – when they came to Norman in uh, – Sam Bradford was a freshman. I was at that game. It's like a million degrees. Oh, you won by, like, 40. All right. Um, looking ahead, a couple more big commits floating out there this week that OU fans are certainly keeping a close eye on. Tomorrow, as in Tuesday, July 18th, Zion Raggins – uh, a receiver from Gray, Georgia. He's a four-star uh, wideout. Is going to commit, uh, announce his commitment. Obviously, you have a crystal ball in for him to go to Oklahoma. And then later this week on Friday is Taylor Tatum, who has been talked about ad nauseum, and for good reason because he's a really special talent. Between OU and USC, yeah. number one running back, also going to play baseball. You also have a crystal ball in for him. Just, I guess, last uh, last thoughts on those two guys before they announce this week how you feel like Oklahoma is sitting uh, going into those uh, commitments. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we will hop on another podcast later on in the week, but if this is my final words on Taylor Tatum, I would literally just say it's been same old, same old that I've been reporting on every platform imaginable since this thing went completely Which sideways. To Oklahoma. Right. Yeah. And – Again, the champion barbecue, the baseball program changed everything. And really the only update I would have that people at home haven't already seen is I talked to somebody the other day just talking some ball. And they said, hey, you you keeping your crystal ball for Oklahoma and Taylor Tatum? And I said, yeah. And the guy goes, well, you're a smart guy, I think. All right, okay, I'll take that as a good sign. <laughs> now, on to Zion Raggins, 
I, I, I think this is going to be another one that trends in Oklahoma's direction, similar to Tatum. Obviously, a much shorter timeline, but mm. and I'll put together a, another notebook here. I, I've been typing it up as as I've attempted to in terrible convention center Wi-Fi, but sure. essentially the note's going to say like, look. Zion Raggins was a heavy Oklahoma lean coming out of his official visit on June 9th, if I remember correctly. I think that visit we again went really well. I think the opportunity to play in Levy's system speaks volumes. I think Jeff Levy and some of those staff members and the ties they have out there in the Southeast played a factor. I think Emmett Jones, really big quality win as far as having that receivers coach in the building and what he could do with a guy like Zion Raggins, right? I mean, I think Emmett Jones is an incredible developer of talent at the wide receiver spot, and it's been evident at places like Texas Tech and Kansas. And I, I think in the end, this one was really only interesting because he ended up kind of taking, I don't want to say surprise official visits, Josh, but like him making it out to Georgia was one that, yeah, and making a phone call or two, I was like, I don't think a lot of people really expected this. And then, he followed it up with Florida State, which he hadn't been to Tallahassee since March. And I, at that point, too, some of our guys at Knowles 24-7 were like, man, I, I haven't seen this kid around campus in forever. So it was kind of like an anything go situation there for a little bit. Mm. But like I, I noted on Sooners Illustrated in the past, those official visits, while notable from what I had been told, hadn't necessarily changed too much. And so we will see what ends up being the final decision. But I'm going to put up a note real quick on Sooners Illustrated. Zion Raggins has told me the official announcement time, or at least the projection. And so we'll be preparing for it at Sooners Illustrated. And I think Oklahoma could land some pretty good news once or twice this week. It would be huge. You get them both in that 24 class, which was, you know, sky was falling not that long ago. Kind of <laughs> Rounding the form pretty good for too long. Last thing, real quick. I, I don't want to keep it too long, but with no, that, on that note, that 24 class, obviously we know the 23 class, top five, highest class signed in quite a while for Oklahoma. Just how you feel the 24 class is kind of coming together right, as things kind of stand right now. The first podcast, first episode, just kind of a temperature check, I guess, on where the 24 class is kind of uh, falling together, rounding into form right now for you. Yeah, man. I mean, look, to say more than it's going good, I think – what really impresses me about this group so far, Josh, is that I think it's doing an outstanding job of addressing some serious needs for mm -hmm. Oklahoma, not only going into next year for the SEC and all of that, but just roster necessities in general, right? I, I think should Oklahoma land a commitment from Zion Raggins, you have to look at this wide receiver group that features Zion Kearney, Ivan Carrion, Kate. Jay Daniels, Dozie Azukanma. I mean, so many names already in the mix, and it could potentially yeah. add in Zion Raggins. I mean, people forget they only signed one wide receiver recruit out of high school this past cycle. They, that was the only one they brought in. Mm -hmm. And Jaquez Petaway, as, as Brent Venables was telling us at Big 12 Media Days, he's doing an outstanding job, but you can't just sign one guy, right. especially the high school. And the wide receiver position, it's also – just from a basic roster to necessity standpoint, on top of only signing one guy, you're not necessarily feeling too great about that room right now. There's just not a ton of go-tos, and Drake Stoops is going to be gone soon. So they needed to sign a ton of wide receivers, and then they needed to bring in a ton of defensive linemen. And I think while this class is very solid, not finished, but pretty solid at defensive back, for example – I think they have their kingpin tight end in Devon Mitchell. But the defensive line was always going to be the primary emphasis. And so things are now trending very positive, positively for Oklahoma in 2024 with those priority tar targets along the defensive front. And if things stay on track, yeah. then the 24 class is going to be one that alters Oklahoma's trajectory going into the SEC. It's by no means done. But yeah. I think as things stand today, to, to wrap up my answer to your question, like the 24 classes are not only checking a few boxes, but they're at least getting the pen closer to checking some others, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's what you like to hear from an Oklahoma fan, obviously. 23 class, uh, fantastic what Brent Venables and that staff pulled off. But 
as has been well documented, to go win at the highest level, you got to stack them. You got to put two, three, four years in a row together. And so it looks like they're, you know, on, in progress of doing that, the 24 to go back on to 2023. Great stuff, Colin. Appreciate you. Obviously, we'll be getting with you uh, regularly on the show, and we'll loop Tom Green into the mix later this week, uh, get the latest from him from his time at SEC Media Days. First episode of the Sooners Illustrated Podcast in the books. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it. We're going to be on with you multiple times a week for the foreseeable future. Uh, season will be here before you know it. Great times are ahead. Good stuff, my man. Just getting started, brother. Always fun. Just getting started. All righty, that's it for us. Be sure to subscribe. Oklahoma.247sports.com. Lots of great stuff there for you from all four of us. Obviously, Colin bringing it with the recruiting intel. Of course, our VIP subscribers on the boards as well. Be sure to tune in and hang out with us. Lots of great stuff coming up. Like I said, season will be here for you. You know it's just about six and a half weeks or so before week one. Ooh, boy. Feels good. All right, counting it down. We'll catch you next time. That's it for now. For Colin Kennedy, James Jackson earlier, I'm Josh Callum.